It was February 1962, about a year after John F. Kennedy had taken office as president of the U.S. Pepe Benitez, the peppery deputy high commissioner, a recent Kennedy appointee, was touring Yap with his party when the guide announced that they had reached a village elementary school. Benitez took a hard look at the shabby building and delivered a furious kick at the rusted corrugated tin wall. A tin shack, he shouted. This is not a school. This is not America. Vowing to get island chiefs whatever they needed to build new schools and hospitals, he said, just tell us what you need and let us go fight for it. Petrus Milo, the chief of Wena, was doubtful. He compared Benitez to a bird that makes a lot of noise and then flies away. He said, I want you to translate for him, because at that time I was translating for him. I want you to translate word for word what I'm going to tell this important man. I said, okay. And he says, tell this man that he's cooling. So I, I, did, I didn't get it. He said, just translate it. So I told the guy, and, you know, the guy thought, I think he thought, wow, you know, it's like an eagle, you know. And he said, tell him that uh, what a cooling is, is a guy that calls his own name as he's flying away. And I did, then he was not a very happy man. <laughs> Years of empty promises had made Micronesians skeptical. But Benitez and the new administration he represented promised real and rapid progress from now on. The U.S. would adopt a new stance towards its neglected trust territory. The world was changing, in Micronesia and elsewhere. A young president had just been elected by the U.S. people in 1960 and proclaimed a national mission to change the world. I believe the problems of human destiny are not beyond the reach of human beings. Let us strive to build peace in the hearts and minds of all people. The Cold War was at its worst. A wall had been erected to separate East and West Berlin. With the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1961 and hostilities in Vietnam heating up, the Berlin Wall was symbolic of the deepening divide between communism and the free world. When a team from the UN visited Micronesia in 1961, they reported that they found considerable dissatisfaction and discontent among the people. I believe that we need a new facilities. This facilities is completely inadequate. Uh, the United Nations uh, was becoming a more diverse a body, uh, uh, including many former colonies. And so the United States was increasingly sensitive to criticism in the United Nations with respect to its administration of the trust territory. At the time, the anti-colonial winds were blowing strongly with the independence movement that had swept over Africa in the previous decade, now beginning to move across the Pacific. The, the Kennedy administration did come in with a, a liberal uh, bias and, and its appointees came back deeply offended uh, by the inaction and the lack of funding that characterized U.S. policy in Micronesia uh, during the Eisenhower years. Perhaps it was time for the U.S. to reevaluate its strategy in Micronesia, islands that had unquestionable strategic value to powers in the Pacific. And in 1962, Kennedy got that report and issue orders because we were also being criticized for not having the High Commissioner's office inside the Trust Territory. And so Saipan was named the capital. Pre-1962, 
President Kennedy authorized an eight-man team, headed by Anthony Solomon, to survey the islands and draw up a master plan for development, but one that would realize U.S. political goals in the area. I met Solomon personally later on in life, and uh, he said, you know, what we had presented were options, and one of those was annexation. The other one was, let them live the way they want, and we will assist with technical assistance. Another one is to concentrate on education because education would open up opportunities, both domestic and abroad. And then the other one was, look, there's just so few of them, you know? It will be very easy to just bring them in as one of the families and, and then we, will, we would fulfill our obligations to developing these people to the UN. So what we had presented were options. But the options all had to lead to the same goal, which was some form of association with the United States. The Solomon Report was a classified U.S. document until Cisco Uledong, a student at the University of Hawaii, discovered a copy and distributed it widely. The plan to engineer consent to be governed by the U.S. was exposed. It sent shockwaves through the territory. It laid out, quote, an integrated master plan for bringing Micronesia into permanent affiliation with the United States. It was revealed as a, as a, uh, as a betrayal of the trust. That's the way Cisco, you know, and I believe him. You know, when I read the thing, I said, yeah. But having then subsequently met Anthony Solomon, uh, it was never intended, you know. It was, it was done with the best of intention, with the best information that they had at that time, yeah. The Solomon Report reinforced the, the, the notion that it was, it was in the interest of the United States to keep these people in these islands as, as closely allied with the United States as possible. And one of the ways to do it was to make us as dependent as possible. So that when it came time to make any kind of a political choice, that that choice would necessarily favor the United States. It was an option that was never acted upon. And it died with Kennedy. Yeah.